Okay, Ryan, I think we're ready to begin. Good afternoon. This is a review session of the New York City Planning Commission for Monday, June 17th. The time is 1.01 p.m. The first item on our agenda is a non euler referral for a UDAP designation and project approval in the Bronx Community District 4. Our presenter is James Moralia. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this is the Bronx Point Project in Community District 4 of the Bronx. The applicant is HPD. The location is at 575 Exterior Street. Um, it's, uh, the action requested is an urban development action area project designation and project approval, otherwise known as a UDAP. You might recall this project as the Lower Concourse North project, which was approved by the commission on August 23rd, 2017. The actions for that approval were the disposition of the site, a zoning map amendment to rezone from M21 to R72, C25, and extend the Harlem River Waterfront District. There were zoning text amendments to create a new subdistrict to the Harlem River Waterfront, uh, to actually uh, make it part of the Harlem River Waterfront Access Plan, and to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area. There was also a special permit to reduce parking in order to facilitate the affordable housing at that site. If you recall, the site is just north of the 145th Street Bridge, just south of Mill Pond Park, just east of the Harlem River, um, southwest of the Bronx Terminal Market, and west of the Hostess Community College complex. It's served by the IRTs and the Lexington Line, as well as the Major Deegan, which runs right uh, adjacent to the site. It has, also has numerous bus lines in the area. There's also the Oak Link Rail Link that um, runs up the shoreline of the Harlem River to the, just to the west of the site as well, and we'll see a picture of that later. Uh, the zoning, again, presently, as per the zoning, is R72C25. Um, and a commercial overlay of C25 over it, uh, yeah, right. And to the uh, west is the Harlem River, to the east is the C44, uh, there's M12s uh, further east, and M M14 R8As to the uh, east as well. You'll notice that the dotted line represents the UDAP area. It is larger than the zoning lot and includes parts of Mill Pond Park as well, and we'll explain that in a second. Here's some shots of the um, site, just to re remind you what it looks like. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is looking from the 145th Street Bridge area straight up the river, and you can see there the Oak Link Rail in, in the river itself, and uh, it runs adjacent to the site. Uh, the second photo is from the park looking into the, the vacant site today. The bottom photo, again, is looking into the site from the park. Uh, number four is uh, the park, again, looking at the vacant site, and across the Harlem River, you see the buildings in Harlem. Um, and number five, again, we're looking at the inlet coming out of the park, which will be part of the UDAP area as well. And the final photograph there is the empty vacant site, uh, which is the, the actual development site. There are no jobs on it. There are no residences. It's vacant at the time, present time. So the UDAP is necessary to help facilitate the financing of the open space within the project area. If you recall, the development site was previously approved in the, in the DISPO in 2017. That's why this is a non ULERP UDAP. Uh, the open space consists of an upland connection here, a short public walkway here, a supplemental access area here, which is part of the Harlem River Waterfront Access Plan, a public plaza along Exterior Street, uh, this shaded out gray is actually the Deegan as it goes over the site. So this is underneath the Deegan right here. Um, there's public access throughout this site. And as I said, the UDAP itself, which is the purple line here, is also uh, financing improvements of, uh, within the park, which includes a new playground here, a new fitness facility area here, expanded barbecue areas here, and rehabilitated revetment along the entire um, Harlem River waterfront as well. All of the WAP requirements will be met as part of phase one of this project. Phase one is the outline of this building here. 
is served by a drive with a circular drop-off. Phase two is to come a little later. Um, let's look at those phases now, a little in detail. The phase one project, which you can see here, is going to be approximately 557,000 square feet. It contains 540 permanently affordable units. The maximum tower height will be 260 feet. It has about 73,000 square feet of commercial uses, including a, a, a theater and a retail on the ground floor. It also has about 60,000 square feet of community facility use, which includes uh, the Hip Hop Museum, as well as an educational facility. Uh, and again, it will include in this phase 125,000 square feet of open space, which I had just detailed. The phase two building, which is ghosted here in the background, would contain 382,000 square feet, about 504 units of affordable housing, a maximum tower height of 375, 5,000 square feet of commercial area, and about 45,000 square feet of community facility use. And here we see a rendering of the project from Exterior Street. Uh, the Hip Hop Museum would be on the second floor here, the retail here, public outdoor space here, more retail here, and the residential entrances would be uh, back behind the building. And here we see a rendering in, in situation, um, the phase one here, the ghosted phase two here, and across the, the bridge to the south is what could be built under the present day Harlem River Waterfront District. That is not a, a, a project at the time, just to show you the scale difference. And again, we see the open space, we see how there's a seamless transition from the existing Mill Pond Park into the, um, the new supplemental area and all the waterfront access. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Questions or comments from the commission? Commissioner Levin. Uh, so just to reiterate, I think what you just said is the purpose, I mean, normally we see these, um, when, when, a, when an HPD project comes to us, it's normally for um, UDAP, project approval, disposition, any rezonings, it's all one big ball of wax. Why did this one have to postpone UDAP to this point? Well, I think it was a decision made by the city to, to go forward with this project in 2017 before a, a developer was selected, so we just kind of broke it up. Okay, and in this case, then, the UDAP is needed in order to finance the open space? It's not only for the open space. The the, uh, the UDAP financing could be used for anything in the project, but the intention is to help with the financing the, of the open space. Okay, okay. But it, so it doesn't preclude other uses, for the, you know. So as I recall, we did look at this project before the developer had been selected and we approved some building envelope And then it came back again. And that was an issue for some of us, that we were um, approving something without really knowing what it was. And so they did come back and make a design presentation to us after the developer had been selected. And I believe, is this exactly this, what they showed us exact, last time? Yeah. So nothing has changed no, since they... No. The only thing that has changed since it was approved here was that the city council brought down the tower height of the tower B from 400 to 375 and change the affordability option to deep affordability, one and deep affordability. Okay. The city council did that, and that's how it stands today. Okay, but the, uh, and, and that's in phase two? Those changes? No. No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's phase it's, one it's and phase two are, it's, this is all one project. It's just how they're building it, honestly. You know, okay. it's, it's all but, the same. But the site plan, the way the park's gonna look, the way the park uh, relates to the existing park. Absolutely. Uh, nothing's yeah. changed. Yeah, nothing has changed. Okay, good, thank you. Other questions? Okay, then uh, we will refer this to the community board for 45 days. I, I will note that the, the um, letter in your package from the community board uh, basically waives the um, review of the referral. So I think we can schedule it for a hearing if that's fine. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, the second item on our agenda, page 15, is a certification of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 2. Our presenter is Nabila Malik. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. 
This is a private application by 419 MM LLC for a landmark preservation special permit to modify use and bulk regulations of the M15B district to facilitate the construction of a new eight story commercial building and the restoration of a three story federal row house and to allow retail use below the level of the second story in both buildings on the property located at 419 Broadway within the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, Manhattan Community District 2. Uh, the project site is located at the northwestern corner of Broadway and Canal Street, and shown on this slide is a rendering of the historic building to remain and be restored and, pro and the proposed eight-story uh, commercial building. This is a photo of the existing condition of the site. It sits at the corner of Broadway and Canal. Uh, you can see the Canal Street subway entrance for the NQRW lines immediately adjacent to the project site. Um, I can highlight it over here. It's a little hard to see. Um, so as detailed in the briefing sheet, the site was created by a merger of three previously existing lots that correspond to three existing buildings, including the historic row house on Broadway um, and a one-story retail building and a two-story building with office over retail to be demolished to make way for the proposed new commercial building. The project site is located on the southern edge of the M15B zoning district in Soho. Once a manufacturing district, Soho today is a dynamic mixed-use district with Broadway and Canal Streets as major commercial corridors where ground floor retail is prevalent. Row houses and tenements intersperse among larger loft buildings that define the general character of the area. Upper floors of these buildings are occupied by a variety of uses, including commercial offices, joint living work quarters for artists and residential lofts. Few conforming heavy commercial and light manufacturing uses remain in the area, including industrial supply wholesalers along Canal Street, as well as food production, wholesale and distribution businesses along Center, Baxter and Hester Streets. The M15B district permits light industrial and commercial uses as of right up to five FAR, and use group six uses are not permitted as of right below the level of the second story. Building bulk is governed by a maximum street wall height and setback distance and sky exposure plane. The area is very well served by transit. Subway lines include NQRW, 456, JZ, and ACE trains. As previously mentioned, the project site is in a regular corner lot located on the northwest corner of Broadway and Canal Street, both wide streets. It has approximately 77 feet of frontage on Canal and 79 feet of frontage on Broadway, with a total lot area of about 6,000 square feet. As proposed, the project site would contain a total of about 30,000 square feet of commercial floor area, which is 5 FAR. Uh, the historic row house to remain was constructed in 1823 and is three stories in height and contains approximately 4,700 square feet of floor area. According to the applicant, historically the building has housed ground floor retail and office above. Um, there's no certificate of occupancy for this building. Pursuant to LPC approval, the applicant would undertake masonry repair and cleaning, metal cornice repair and painting, replacement of wood windows at the primary and rear facades, the installation of new metal roofing um, and slate roofing at the rear, and the installation of a new wood storefront and entry door featuring a cast iron cornice and piers. As required by the special permit, the applicant would additionally implement a cyclical maintenance plan to ensure the continued maintenance of the building in perpetuity. As shown on the elevations of the proposed building, contrary to the M15B bulk regulations, the proposed new commercial building would rise without setback above the maximum allowable base height of 85 feet to a height of 115 feet along both the Broadway and Canal Street frontages. The neighborhood character diagrams of both sides of Broadway and Canal show that the proposed building as approved by 
LPC is in keeping with the surrounding context. This is along Broadway and this is along Canal. To facilitate the proposed project, the applicant seeks bulk waivers above the maximum base height and within the initial 15 foot setback area from Broadway and Canal Street, which is highlighted in yellow. The proposed waivers would allow the building to take a form more consistent with the loft style buildings in the historic district. The applicant also seeks a, a use waiver to allow use group six retail and office uses below the level of the second story of both buildings, which is highlighted in blue. Um, specifically, the ground floors of the historic building and new building would be connected and primarily occupied by retail uses. A small office entrance and access area is located along Canal Street at the western portion of the site. Seller, the cellar would be shared between use group six office, retail, and accessory uses. And the applicant has obtained all necessary LPC approvals for the conditions of a continued maintenance program and a certificate of um, appropriateness for the bulk modifications. Uh, the applicant seeks a 74711 special permit to facilitate the construction of a new eight story commercial building and the restoration of a three story federal row house um, and seeks the special permit to allow retail use below the level of the second story in both buildings. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Commissioner De La Luz. Um, can you go to the floor planning? And I mean, I'm trying to see What's, so the subway entrance that's there yes. now will, will remain? Correct. And so how will it be impacted, if at all? Um, I, I don't think there will be an impact to it. Um, the, during construction, the, the existing structures will be demolished. Um, and then um, after that, the, the subway entrances will remain as they are. Okay. Just seems like an opportunity missed. <laughs> Commissioner Levin. Yeah, well, that was actually the gist of my question here about whether there was any thought of um, pulling those stairs into <laughs> the new building. Um, you know, I recognize this is a small site and it's not in a any of the sort of areas where we can compel that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed that on the straight across Broadway, there is a relatively new three-story building that does have the subway entrance mm -hmm. inside the building. So I kind of wondered how did that happen and does the same process potentially apply here? Um, we can certainly look into that and, and talk to the applicant about it. Commissioner Rampershad. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm, there's only one means of egress out from the cellar. You can just have the applicant, I guess, confirm that's all you need. Sure, I can double check that. All right, thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, then this application is certified. Thank you. Item three on the agenda, page 43, is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 2. Our presenter is Anthony Grande. Good afternoon. Um, this is a private application by Fleet Center Inc. for zoning map and text amendments to facilitate the development of a new 14-story approximately 205,000 square foot commercial office building at 101 Fleet Place in downtown Brooklyn. So the project area location is in the downtown Brooklyn area of Brooklyn Community District 2. Uh, the proposed project area is a rectangular area uh, fronting on the mid-block portion of the east side of Fleet Place, um, a narrow street with widths between uh, 50 and 60 feet, uh, between Willoughby Street to the south and uh, Myrtle Avenue to the north. The area has a depth of 200 feet and a width of 164 feet along uh, the Fleet Place frontage. 
The project area contains the proposed development site, which is an approximately 20,000 square foot, irregularly shaped uh, interior lot with a single frontage on Fleet Place. The development site is currently improved with a one-story brick building uh, with an early childhood education facility, uh, which provides uh, pre-K daycare services. The project area is within an existing R6 district, which covers the majority of the block and extends to the east to cover uh, the majority of the area um, east of uh, the project site. R6 districts are medium density districts that allow residential and community facility uses. Under the height factor option, residential development has a maximum FAR of 2.43 uh, with no fixed height limits. Uh, under the quality housing option, residential development on a narrow street uh, would have a maximum FAR of 2.2 with a contextual envelope limiting base height to four stories and total building height to five stories. Uh, community facility uses are allowed to a maximum FAR 4.8. Um, the other zoning districts on the block uh, include the R71 district, which uh, is just to the north uh, running along Myrtle Avenue. And to the west across Fleet Place is a C64 district, which, uh, which is a high density uh, commercial and mixed use district uh, generally found in um, central business districts. The surrounding area has a mixed character. Uh, generally to the west is a uh, high density commercial and mixed use area of downtown Brooklyn, uh, the city's third largest central business district. This area generally contains high rise commercial office buildings and mixed use buildings uh, with residential development. To the north and west of the project area, uh, there are several recently constructed residential high rise buildings uh, with uh, ground floor retail. Um, these buildings range from 32 to 42 stories. To the west across Flatbush Avenue extension is the uh, MetroTech campus, which is a major commercial employment hub. And just south along Flatbush Avenue is the 1.6 million square foot uh, city point development with over 600,000 square feet of retail space um, in a multi-story podium. To the south of the project area across uh, Willoughby Street is the Brooklyn campus of Long Island University. And to the east of the project area uh, is a medium density, primarily residential area. Um, this area is well served by transit. Um, three subway stations are located within a 10 minute walk from the project area. Uh, the DeKalb Avenue uh, BQR station and the J Street Metrotech ACFR station and the Nevin Street 2345. Uh, the block containing the development site is primarily residential. Um, directly to the east and the south are the University Towers, which is a 550 unit apartment complex of three uh, 15 story towers. Um, surrounded by primarily by parking lots. Um, these buildings were developed in 1958 and approximately comply with the existing R6 zoning uh, with no commercial components. Um, to the north along Myrtle Avenue, there are three recently constructed uh, mixed use buildings uh, ranging from nine to 15 stories. And these are, were built uh, pursuant to the R71 zoning. Directly across Fleet Place from the project area um, is a four-story commercial office building that uh, the building predates um, existing zoning. So this is a view from Fleet Place of the project area from the street level. Uh, we can see the development sites with the uh, one-story brick building in the center and the adjacent 15-story uh, building to the north. And um, just to the left of the photo, we can see the 32-story the, uh, uh, building just across Fleet Place. And in this view facing south, we see the project area as well as the uh, nearest of the university towers um, just south of the development site. Uh, note that the street widens here, which is sort of visible on the right um, hand side of the photo. Um, the street widens from 50 feet to 60 feet uh, near the northern edge of the project area. The proposed development would be a new 14 story, approximately 205,000 square foot uh, commercial office building for a total FAR of uh, 10. 
while the building is designed as an office building, um, there would be ground floor space that uh, the applicant has described could be used for retail as well. Um, the first two floors of the proposed building would be recessed at the street level to provide additional space in front of the building's entryway. The street wall on floors three through six would abut the street line, and then above the sixth floor, there would be a 20-foot setback, after which the building would rise to 14 stories and a total height of 196 feet. Uh, one loading berth would be required by the C64 district commercial regulations. Um, this is shown in the northern edge of uh, the proposed development um, illustrative plan. In order to facilitate the proposed developments, the applicant requests two actions. First would be a zoning map amendment. Uh, the project area is proposed to be changed from an R6 district to a C64 district, uh, uh, effectively extending the district from across the street uh, to cover the project area. Uh, the proposed zoning map would also reflect the expansion of the special downtown Brooklyn district, denoted by the area shaded in gray on the zoning map. C64 districts are high-density commercial districts that allow commercial and community facility uses to a maximum FAR of 10.0 and residential uses with MIH to a maximum FAR of 12.0. Uh, within the special downtown Brooklyn district, C64 districts have two options for height and setback regulations. Uh, one option is to comply with the contextual zoning envelope for R10 districts which for narrow streets allows a maximum height, uh, base height of 125 feet and a maximum height of 185 feet. Um, alternatively, buildings may use the tower regulations defined in the special district text, which require setbacks for portions of buildings above 85 feet and has lot coverage limits um, for towers above certain heights. Um, generally, no height limit applies to C64 districts. Uh, second, the applicant seeks a zoning text amendment uh, for two separate sections of the zoning resolution. One amendment would affect Article 10, Chapter 1, uh, which has a series of seven maps that define the boundary of the special downtown Brooklyn district, and uh, the proposed amendment would change the boundary to include the project area on all seven maps. And on map six, um, as shown on the left side of the screen, uh, the map would expand the height limitation area uh, to include the project area, so this would um, limit height within the project area to 400 feet. Um, the other text amendment would change Appendix F of the zoning resolution to add the project area as a new MIH area, mapping options one and two. Um, although the proposed project would be all commercial and not subject to MIH, the proposed rezoning allows an increase in residential floor area, therefore an MIH area would be mapped here, and if a project were to include a residential component, it would be subject to MIH. Thank you. Before opening it up to the commission, I do want to note that the department is pleased to see a proposal for a 100% office building in downtown Brooklyn, but we have expressed to the applicant our concerns about the density that is being proposed. And with that, I'll toss it open. Commissioner Levin. <clears throat> well, I guess that um, partially addresses the, the question I was going to uh, raise, I mean, by one argument, by the applicant's argument, this is, in fact, I think the EAS even claims that this site is in the heart of the downtown Brooklyn commercial district, but actually, not quite. It's, um, it would be a, a fairly notable incursion of a commercial zoning designation into a residential area, um, and I'm be interested to see what response we get um, from public review about that um, land use change. Um, I also note that with the zoning that they're requesting, the we should also um, be sure we understand what might happen with this zoning um, independent of this building, sites change hands, and the um, EI, EAS um, studies as an alternative, a 34-story residential building, which um, I can imagine um, poses some questions, but we need to, I think as we consider this, we need to think about 
what kind of residential development might happen should this project, should, should, should the area get rezoned in this project um, change. Um, so I just put those out there as things to think about when they come back to us. Um, two sort of nuts and bolts questions. What's happening to the daycare center? Have, are they on board with this project? Uh, do we know where they're going to go? Or maybe they're going away? And does the building at the corner of Myrtle Avenue have lot line windows that will be brought, blocked? So to the first question, um, the applicant has explained uh, that the daycare center, they're on a year-to-year -year lease, and it's been that way for a few years. So, you know, their understanding is if this goes through, then, um, you know, the lease would expire and uh, the, the daycare center would have to relocate. Um, as far as the lot line windows, um, I think based on what I've seen that there are windows uh, after sort of the setback from the side, which is sort of visible here um, in the rendering, but I don't believe that there are, uh, there aren't legal windows uh, facing the lot line, but I think there are some sort of smaller windows that-, that Windows be, that may not be legally required. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, and then back to the daycare center. Yes, of course, legally, maybe it's just a year-to-year -year lease, um, but uh, I think we need to understand the importance of that service in that community, what the state of their contracts are for continuing to provide the service. Is it needed? What alternative locations might there be? You know, this goes beyond a zoning question, but into a um, public impact question. And I think we can try to provide some more information at the next hearing as well and um, continue to raise this with the applicant. Um, okay. Well, Brooklyn Community Services is operating it, so they presumably know what they're doing and be able to speak speak for themselves. Thank you, Commissioner Bernie. So uh, am I right in thinking then that this is not necessarily what would be built? It could be flipped to another building. What we're really talking about here is not approving a building, but approving a text amendment to the zoning. So it would have been helpful if city planning had provided alternative massings to show what could happen here, because it's a little misleading. You see this rendering and you think, well, that's what you're approving, but really we're not. And certainly that is, we will do that during the review period and also in hearing what concerns come from the community. And again, we have already expressed to the applicant um, our concerns about the district that they selected um, and our sense that, can you go back to the first project area um, that shows Metrotech? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we have been comfortable with a lot of density along Flatbush Avenue extension, which is quite wide and stands in marked contrast to Fleet Place, which is almost difficult to see. Yeah. Is this the project where BCS are working with a developer and they, are they part of that deal? Is that what I heard? It's no. not my understanding that they're no. working no. on this. Okay. No. Okay. Commissioner Veloz. I'm just wondering if we're aware or of any information, uh, conversations that the developers had with the community board thus far in terms of uh, getting input and, I mean, or is this really, I mean, I know it's the first formal time that the community board's gonna be given a chance, but I'm just wondering if there have been conversations that, that led up to this. I think there have been conversations. I am not really familiar with, you know, what the outcome of the conversations have been, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Other comments? Okay, then the application is certified. Item four on the agenda. Uh, hold on. Uh, page, uh, where are we at? Uh, 78 is a pre-hearing review of a site selection and acquisition in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Alia Carrier. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a pre-hearing application for proposed action by the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for a site selection and acquisition of property by the City of New York for assignment to parks. Spring Creek Park is located in East New York of Brooklyn Community District 5. Spring Creek is 105 acres of undeveloped salt marsh in the North Jamaica Bay. 
Upon acquisition of the proposed sites, parks will move forward with a plan to improve and restore ecosystem function of Spring Creek. The project is lar part of a larger preservation of open space uh, led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So the, it's right up here, that's the actual, the sites. Um, okay, so south of the Shore Parkway at the mouth of Spring Creek, other parkland is managed by the U.S. National Service as Gateway National Recreation Area and, and managed by New York State as the Shirley Chisholm State Park. To the west of the project area is Gateway Center, a major commercial hub in the area, as well as Brooklyn Development Center, which is currently being redeveloped into mixed use and commercial by the uh, New York State Urban Development Corporation. The immediate surrounding area is marshland and open space, as well as multifamily residences zoned R4 east of the project site in Lindenwood. The project area is located on one tax block, four lots, and a portion of Drew Street in the Spring Creek neighborhood of East New York. The proposed project area consists of four privately owned and a portion, four privately owned lots and a portion of Drew Street, a mapped but unbuilt street between the three lots. Here we have photos of the subject properties, which are dominated by urban fill and invasive vegetation. Community Board 5 held a public hearing on this item on April 18th and recommended approving the application with 29 in favor, zero opposing, and zero abstaining. On May 24th, the borough president held a public hearing on the item. There were no speakers and the borough president recommended approving with no modifications or conditions. The borough president recommended parks advise the city council on the following. Coordinate with DEP and DOT regarding the installation of rain gardens and engage with DOT to consider util utilizing city bench and city street programs uh, along the 75th street perimeter and installing lights, sidewalks, or guardrails along the undeveloped western edge of 75th street. The public e hearing is scheduled for Wednesday, uh, June 9th. And that concludes our presentation. Questions from the commission? Okay, this is ready for public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. <coughs> Item five, uh, page 93, is a pre-hearing review of a UDAP designation and disposition in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Alexandra Patty Diaz. Good afternoon, commissioners. The New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development proposes an urban development action area designation and urban development action area project approval for three vacant city owned properties to facilitate the construction of three new buildings with approximately 41 affordable units in Brooklyn. Two project areas are located within the East New York rezoning area approved by the City Planning Commission in 2016. The cluster is in the north central area of East New York, neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 5. Project Area 1 is located at 190 Essex Street. Project Area 2 is located at 223 227 Vermont Street. And Project Area 3 is located at 581 and 583 Belmont Avenue. I will walk you through each of the project areas. Project Area 1 is located at 190 Essex Street, which is on the west side of Essex Street within an R5B zoning district. Project Area is served by numerous public facilities and institutions and is accessible through public transit. Development Site 1 is a vacant lot of approximately 9,800 square feet. And the building will be a three-story walk-up with approximately 15 units in a total height of 30 feet. The building will have a total floor area of approximately 13,000 square feet and an outdoor recreational open space in the rear yard of approximately 5,200 square feet. Amenities in the building are provided and the unit breakdown will be one bedroom and two bedroom units. Project Area 2 is located at 223-227 Vermont Street, which is on the east side of Vermont Street, 
within an N14R6A within the Special Mixed Youth District 16 and R5B Zoning District. The area is well served by a public facilities and accessible through public transportation. Development site two is a vacant city owned lot of approximately 7,900 square feet. Subsequent to reviews Subsequent to review session, HPD amended the application to adjust the proposed building to comply with zoning. New building is as follows. It will be a three-story walk-up building with approximately 11 units, reaching a, reaching a total height of approximately 33 feet. It will have a total floor area of approximately 10,000 square feet and a, an outdoor open space in the rear yard of approximately 4,400 square feet. Amenities are provided within the building and it will include one bathroom and two bathroom units. Project area three is located at 581 and 583 Belmont Avenue, which is on the northern side of Belmont Avenue within an R5 zoning district. The project area three is served by numerous educational facilities and is accessible through public transit. Development site three has a lot area of approximately 10,000 square feet. As, third, as certified, lot 32 was excluded from the disposition request since the tax lot has a previous board of estimates approval for the disposition. Subsequent to review session, HPD amended the application to include lot 32 within the disposition request, so the whole project has the same approvals. Belmont Avenue building will be a three-story walk-up building with approximately 15 affordable units and a total height of 30 feet. The proposed building will have a total floor area of approximately 12,500 square feet and the entrance will be through Belmont Avenue. The outdoor space will be of approximately 5,600 square feet. Amenities are including within the building that will also have one bathroom and two bathroom units. HBD is requesting a designation of an urban development action area approval and an urban development action area project and disposition of city of all city owned properties. The development site will be conveyed to a developer selected by HPD. CB5 uh, did not hold a meeting for the project. Uh, Brooklyn Borough President hold a, meeting, uh, a hearing on May 1st and approve with no modifications. Further recommendations include to prioritize outreach to include senior households and formerly homeless families, to incorporate resiliency and sustainability energy and storm water practices within the project sites, to advance vision zero of policies that improve pedestrian safety and advance environmental sensitive tree disposals. CPC public hearing is scheduled next Wednesday, June 19th. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Bernie. So uh, again, these renderings that we see, are these actual designs that will be built? Are they already assigned to a developer or are we just looking at a UDAP? Um, to my understanding, these are the designs and the developer is already selected. Okay. It's a joint venture between East Brooklyn Congregations, M. Lapping and the Markle Group. Okay. And, and to what extent is HPD conducting design reviews of the developer's work? And the reason I say that is, you know, I, I think there's a place for innovative and experimental architecture and there's also a place for calm, quiet, contextual architecture. And, one wonders why, if you look, well, for example, go to slide eight. Yes. Oh, sorry for the That's right. speed. No worries. So there's a very consistent facade of particular style, right? <laughs> and you're inserting an addition in there, um, which looks nothing like in terms of massing and scale, what the others look like, right? And if you go on, go back to your rendering of the three altogether. Um, the... Yeah, the first slide, your first slide. Oh. 
I, I would have thought point. that what HPD would be looking for here would be to look around at the sort of context, the type of materials that are used, and have buildings that are complementary to that context. So my question is, to what extent is HPD pursuing that policy? We can HPD certainly ask be, HPD yeah. to <laughs> testify to that yeah. on Wednesday. Okay, thank you. And we should also note that we work closely with HPD and we encourage them to think creatively about the context and how to design their buildings, particularly Alexandra is understating her role in this and pushing yeah. HPD uh, to be the best design possible. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner De La Luz. I mean, I would just say as, you know, as someone whose organization has quite a bit of experience um, with HPD builds, um, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I, I think it often, um, because some, some of that is the aesthetic and in the eye of the beholder kind of a thing, um, at HPD, if it's not within the specific design guidelines, I think they al generally allow some flexibility on that where they just don't necessarily allow as much flexibility <laughs> these days. Um, it has to do with um, the size of units and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, certain building systems and um, ensuring that uh, the developers are abiding by uh, enterprise green community standards yeah. as, as a minimum. Yeah. I understand that. No, I, I look at these images and, and I was, I'm, when I look at these things, I'm always thinking, what's it going to be like in 10 years, 15 years, 25 years? And this sort of Legoland stuff, it, it ages pretty quickly, you know? And there are other tried and true methods of doing this kind of contextual housing. I mean, you know, obviously there are cases where you want uh, avant-garde and innovation, but I don't know if this is quite the place for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner De La Luz. Um, I, again, I, I hear you. I, you know, the one thing I would say, um, and this, I, I think it is a, an important point for HPD as well, um, especially when we're talking about infill development of this size, the cost per square foot or cost per dwelling unit um, may be a consideration. Um, and, uh, you know, the extent of flexibility to try to achieve um, facades that are age, that would age better um, under HPD term sheets, I think is something to be discussed for infill projects. The, I think you're right, Commissioner, that we are seeing this progression of or succession of HPD projects on smaller lots, whereas before there had been a larger cutoff. Um, and the benefits obviously are that um, in addition to providing housing on lots that have been eyesores in the neighborhood. Some of them also provide opportunities for home ownership, which is yet another positive. The flip side is that I would imagine the financing is all the harder. Yeah. No, it's really good that they're that doing this. I mean, I think it's the way to, to fill in some of those underutilized. There was a competition recently uh, organized with HPD mm -hmm. on how to design for these narrow lots. And that might be, I mean, I would like to see the results of that translate into this process. We can ask HPD to give us an update on where they are on their small lots design competition. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Rampershad. Just looking at the three renderings, I'm just curious, the building in the middle, which I believe is for a mine, there's no roof access, or can you find out? Um, to my understanding, none of the roof are going to be accessible for the public. So those are not stair bulkheads on the other two? Uh, I mean, in other words, is the stair going to go to the roof for the building? Right. In the I think it's just for maintenance, uh, but I can ask HPD to clarify, to clarify that on Wednesday. Okay. What are what is the program for the roof? Okay. Thank you. Oh, of course. Other questions? Okay, then we'll hear this at the public hearing on Wednesday. All right, item six, page 135, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 8. Our presenter is Scott Solomon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the applicant, Queens Community Board 8, proposes a zoning map amendment from R2 to R2X for two non-contiguous areas in the Kew Garden Hills neighborhood in CD8. The project area consisting of 378 tax lots across 16 blocks is located northeast of the Kew Gardens Interchange to the east of the uh, of Flushing Meadows Corona Park. 
this proposal is primarily intended to permit horizontal enlargements into the rear yard of existing homes while maintaining the low density single family character of the neighborhood. The proposed R2X district was established in 1989 by the lower density contextual zoning text amendment and includes a set of zoning regulations that typically produce homes with a larger footprint and higher floor area ratio. A zoning text amendment is also required to enable this rezoning. Uh, zooming in, the surrounding area is predominantly developed with one family residences and some multifamily buildings. The project area, zone R2, is surrounded by several low density zoning districts, including R32, R4, R41, and R4B. The project area made of two sub areas, project area A to the north, B to the south, is generally bounded by 72nd Avenue to the north, Union Turnpike to the south, Park Drive East to the west, and Main Street and Valley Place to the east. The project area contains three public parks and is well served by public transit. New York City Transit operates several local express and select bus service routes along Main Street and Union Turnpike. Uh, access to the E and F subway lines uh, are available to the southwest. The Kew Gardens interchange beyond the uh, uh, boundaries of this map above. Uh, just note uh, the aerial above is rotating 90 degrees with Flushing Meadows Park to the west in the, in the uh, background. Uh, the project area has been zoned R2 since 1961. It was mapped so uh, to reflect the existing built environment at the time. R2 districts are limited to single family detached homes with an FAR of 0.5 and uh, uh, required to have 30 foot rear yards, 15 foot front yards. Although R2 districts provide some flexibility in, the, in building large homes, current residents view it as too constrictive for their larger families. Above are two photos of, uh, uh, from homes in project area A. Uh, both, ref uh, both uh, one on the left, excuse me, was built prior to 1961. The one to the right was a more recent building. Both con uh, comply with the existing R2 district regulations. Uh, same pattern above from uh, project area B to the south, a home on the left, pre-61, one to the right, post-61. Uh, above is the proposed zoning change map. The dotted black lines in the right show that the, show the proposed R2X district boundaries unchanged from the existing R2 district boundaries. There's no specific project to be facilitated by, this, by these actions. The rezoning is intended to provide additional uh, uh, flexibility, additional floor area for existing homes, flexibility uh, in the bulk regulations for future new construction while also maintaining the character of the neighborhood. Community has proposed this rezoning, again, uh, to provide flexibility for the larger families. Uh, above is a comparison chart of the R2 and R2X districts. Most prominent changes is the increase of FAR to 1.02 with attic allowance and the minimum rear yard now at 20 feet. Uh, after certification on April 22nd, uh, community board uh, quickly uh, recommended approval May 8th with a vote of 38 in favor to oppose, followed by a uh, nearly quick uh, uh, turnaround by the borough president on May 28th, recommending approval. Uh, in conclusion, again, this is a single family, single family rezoning con consistent with the 89 text amendment uh, to uh, allow an R2 district's large single family detached dwellings with a high lot coverage. Uh, several homes in this area have had extensions built prior to 61, uh, resulting in FAR non-compliance. This will bring uh, this these properties 100% into compliance. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Okay, then we will hear this at a public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. Item seven on the agenda is a city council modification scope determination to strike MIH option two and add deep affordability uh, to the two Howard rezoning, uh, which the city council believes apparently is not Howard enough. Um, staff believes that these changes are in scope. And so I would ask for an assent by show of hands to send a letter to the city council telling them that it's within scope. Okay, done. Madam Chair, I'm just recused from that. Yes. Item, so oh, just yes. Just for the record. So. All right. 
Item eight, a city council modification scope determination uh, to strike option, MIH option two for the Brook 156 uh, project. Staff believes that this also, uh, these changes are also in scope. And once again, a sent by show of hands to send the letter. Done. Item nine, a city council modification scope determination for Haven Green. Annie White will uh, discuss. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm here on behalf of Sylvia Lee, who was the project manager for this. Um, but as you may recall, the application by the Department of Housing Preservation Development for disposition of city-owned property was approved by the City Planning Commission on April 10th of 2019. On June 11th, the City Council voted on the application and has proposed draft modifications. The modification would restrict the disposition to require the provision of approximately 8,400 square feet of open space to be permanently accessible to the public. Of that 8,400, approximately 6,700 square feet would be open to the sky, um, shown in that rendering on the right, and 1,700 square feet would be a covered pedestrian passageway on, onto Elizabeth Street. The amount and configuration of this open space required by the proposed City Council modification is the same as was proposed by the applicant and what was considered by the Commission. The Department has reviewed the proposed changes and determined that these proposed modifications raise no land use or environmental issues requiring further review. Any questions from the Commission? Okay, then once again, a sent by show of hands to send the letter. Thank you. Item 10, a city council modification scope determination for the Bay Street corridor plan. Joe Helferty is here to discuss. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, here to discuss the city council modifications to the land use actions intended to facilitate the Bay Street corridor neighborhood plan, uh, specifically the text amendment. Um, the commission voted to approve this application on April 22nd, and on June 11th, city councils proposed the following modifications. Uh, first, with regard to the uh, FAR exemption for school uses at the Special Stapleton Waterfront District, uh, City Council has modified to uh, state that such school must be public and operated by the Department of Education. Regarding the use and applicability regulations of the Special Bay Street Corridor District uh, for certain uses in sub-area D, uh, the City Council has clarified to state that such use must be uh, for a public service or public transportation use. Uh, regarding mandatory inclusionary housing, City Council has proposed that options one and three be applicable to the Bay Street Corridor and Canal Street rezoning areas. Um, and additionally, minor modifications were made to the Special Bay Street Corridor's uh, subdistricts A and D uh, to modify bulk and density regulations. So in subdistrict A, which again is the northernmost parcel in the rezoning area, uh, City Council has proposed to uh, lower the floor area ratio for MIH sites from 4.6 to 4.0, uh, as well as reduce the maximum building height from 145 feet to 125 feet. Uh, additional modifications were made to street wall requirements for portions of the building uh, taller than the base height. And in subdistrict D, uh, City Council has proposed to establish two sub areas, D1 and D2. Uh, sub area D1 would remain unchanged from what the Commission had approved. Uh, sub area D2, which is primarily comprised of lots that are sharing a uh, adjacent district boundary with the R3X district uh, to have a reduced height in FAR. So this would be subdistrict two would have a 2.75 FAR uh, for MIH sites, as well as a 65 foot maximum base height. Uh, so upon review, the department believes that these modifications are within scope and present no further issues. Any questions? Commissioner Velouz. Is this the first time that there's a proposed modification to uh, FAR and base height within MIH as part of a neighborhood rezoning? We can check. I believe East Harlem had modifications to Did FAR it? and okay. base height. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Cirillo. Yeah, I, I just want to say that it's, it's um, and I realize what is before us 
today. But I think it needs to be said, and Joe, thank you so much for the sort of the wrap up here, um, that there is a, I think what, what's happened here today, I think requires us at some point to think about the role that we play in the identification and review of the affordability options. And what I mean by that is that all, all the options are available in the text. So there's, there's never a point as to whether or not they're actually not in scope when they come back to us. But when you think about the development of MIH and the options that were d discussed and, and identified with particular attention in this, what I'm saying now, about the workforce option, it was developed specifically <laughs> for this community's opportunities. And so the idea that it's not, and I respect the council's authority in modifying the application, so that's not the issue at all, but it does raise the question as to the role we play in the review and analysis of any option in any neighborhood because applicants are selecting an option, multiple options that they believe is appropriate, variety appropriate for the community, appropriate for financing, whatever the, the reasons may be. And then we review those in our process, the public comments on them. Um, very often we're only really focused on the ones that are there and we're trying to learn about the ones that are not. Um, and then at the end of that process, regardless of what we've done, they go to the council and the council makes their legally uh, optional decision about how this part of the process proceeds. And maybe it's clearer to me because it's, here where I've, I've seen this, I knew how we developed workforce, I know why it existed, um, but I just wonder whether or not we should be thinking about how this works through our portion of the public review process and whether or not, since all of these options are always in scope, that we are in analyzing all of these options and the appropriateness for a community so that at least in the public review process, we're providing information for the next phase of the land use view, review process that we've gotten to discuss all of the options. I mean, we, we, we could actually go through a process where there's one option in an application and when it comes back to us, it's an option we've never even discussed. And there seems to be something wrong with that, for at least for me. And so maybe it's highlighted today um, it, in, because of looking at how this has played out. Um, but I just wanted to share that sort of thought about it because so many pieces of the land use process and we've seen this um, time and time again, are being decided you know, af after us. And again, it's all within what the charter had potentially envisioned. It's happening more often than not. And, and if it comes back to us and all we're doing is saying, yes, it's in scope, then perhaps we should be looking at all of these things with a different eye than we are at the, this point in time. I would note, Commissioner, that I think there are many discussions that could be had about aldermanic privilege of the tradition and, in the council. I, again, I'm not, I'm trying to figure out deferral. how to fit in better. But I actually think that this is MIH working the way that it was intended. And um, I certainly would not suggest a reopening of MIH. It is relatively recent. And I don't see that the structure of it, providing the four options, is flawed, even if you might disagree with what the council, at least the council land use committee voted on unanimously for the options here. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm not challenging what the council has done. I'm trying to figure out, and I'm not suggesting reopening MIH. I, 
I, although I don't know where we will ever use workforce again if it's not here, but and maybe another point in time it becomes relevant in, in communities. But if it's not relevant in a neighborhood that was looking to address the needs of the neighborhood it was adjacent to and an entire borough that had other options with then it, it's hard to imagine where it may exist elsewhere. However, I can't see into the future. I can only deal with the present. And I feel like because of the way it works, we should then be looking at the implications of all of the options in our review, knowing that it's possible that the council will determine in their right that one of the options we haven't even focused on is the right one. And then we're and then all we're doing at the end after we've spent a lot of time, resources, staff time, our own homework and review. And of course, in some cases, this is a city application. It could be a private application where we've asked applicants to come back with additional information. And at the end of the process, it isn't even what we had been focused on. So I just wonder if under the existing process, there's a way to get more information about all the different options so we have something that we're working with better than and more reliably than we are today. I would, I would note, Commissioner, that that is what was done at the time of the adoption of MIH and the determination of including the options. It's not a land use determination on a case by case basis. And again, the question before us is the scope of oh, what I, I Understood, and I began by saying I understand what, the, uh, what, what we're being asked to do today, but the reflection that I'm sharing is just based upon the practice that seems to be occurring. And I just wondered if there was a way this we could play a better role then in educating during the way and learning even for ourselves what all of the potential options could be in a community as opposed to focus only on the ones that the applicant has given us. And then it turns out that it isn't even any of the things that we've spent time discussing and working on. I mean, I know, again, it's not being able to look into the future, but I, I just thought I would share that point of view. Commissioner Delos. I wasn't here on the day that this was voted on, so I didn't I didn't get a chance to comment on this. But um, and I, I think it's perhaps a, a friendly suggestion in relation to um, my colleagues' points. I mean, you know, MIH is about the reason why we put it in place was to promote and preserve affordable housing within New York City writ large and then within specific communities. And I think one of the practices that we've begun to establish here when um, rezonings happen um, is staff presenting information about local AMI. And I think that's an important piece of information as part of thinking about um, what is appropriate to be mapped. I also believe, honestly, that understanding what is market currently at the local level is an, another important piece of information because 130% of AMI, or the workforce option, is market rate or even perhaps above market rate in certain communities. Um, and so I think all of that information is helpful along with where are the greatest gaps in AMI at the local level and then citywide? Like if we have, I think those four pieces of information as we talk about this, then I think, you know, um, to Commissioner Cerullo's point, I think, I, I know that when I hear about these things, I'm, I'm calculating all that in my head and I'm writing all that down. That's when I'm thinking about what the greatest need is in that particular community. And I think um, people can disagree about certain things, um, but uh, I, I think that would be a helpful exercise for everybody um, as part of a process and, and perhaps making that more explicit would be helpful. I, I, I certainly am glad that this is the modification that is coming back um, because 130% um, of AMI, even in Staten Island, is market rate or above market rate, and I, I'm not sure that, at least I don't believe the intention of MIH um, was to peg um, the AMI level to whatever market rate is at that local community. Um, it's, I think it's about trying to bring in affordable units or preserve existing affordable units. So that might mean that that option is more appropriate for a neighborhood where AMI is even much higher than that. 
in my opinion. Um, and I will just say from a practical standpoint of having to market 130% of AMI units in communities that um, where 130% of AMI is at market or higher, they're actually very challenging to fill. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's something to take note of. Thank you, those were helpful suggestions and I, I hope you've noticed that we have started as a routine matter, including the AMI. Your suggestion about comparison to market to the extent we can get that information, we'll try and include that as well. Okay, other comments? Okay, then I'll ask for an assembly show of hands to the narrow issue before us, which is that this is within scope. Thank you. Thank you. For the June 19th public meeting, staff have prepared reports for uh, the 273 Avenue U rezoning. Um, also scheduled for a decision on June 19th are 428 Loretto Street, Stanley Avenue, and 68 Butterworth Avenue, all in Staten Island. For post-hearing follow-ups, um, 201, 207th Avenue, remaining questions on that, okay. And then one Penn Plaza, other questions on that, okay. I believe that that concludes the review session for the New York City Planning Commission for Monday, June 17th, 2019. The time is 12, or 2.12 uh, p.m. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>